Good evening. We're about to get on with the main event, our speaker. Uh, but before I do that, I'm Haley Elmlinger. This is Catherine Tompkins. We're co-chairs of the Board of Trustees of the Greenwich Historical Society. Thank you. Um, I, I just have a, a couple more thank yous before um, Catherine introduces our speaker. Um, I need to thank our four fabulous co-chairs, Barbara McDonald, Ann Ogilvy, Heather Sargent, Holly Casson, and, and the staff for putting together this magical evening. It is absolutely stunning in here, so thank you, thank you. We also want to thank our host committee, Barbara and Ray Dalio, Isabel and Peter Malkin, Debbie and Russ Reynolds, Josie Merck Stevenson, Davida and Ron Strackbein, and Hugh Vanderbilt, as well as our presenting sponsor, First Republic Bank. Thank you for your generous support this evening. The proceeds of tonight's event will support three core pillars of our mission. One, preservation of our beloved Bush Holly House. Two, the educational programs that we bring to the community, including our important Title I schools. And thirdly, the exhibitions and public programs that bring our community together. So thank you all for your support. Catherine will now introduce our esteemed speaker. Thank you, Haley. It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Woo. We are honored to have such a distinguished advocate for authentic leadership as the special guest at our 90th anniversary celebration. Doris Kearns Goodwin was born in Brooklyn and raised on Long Island, where she shared a great love of baseball with her father. For those who are curious, Miss Goodwin is a Red Sox fan. Okay. All right, let's keep it civil. Um, she graduated from Colby College and she earned her PhD at Harvard. Her interest in leadership began when she served as a White House fellow, working directly with President Lyndon Johnson. He was so impressed with her that he later hired her to assist with his memoir. It was this work that inspired her best-selling biography, Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream. Doris Kearns Goodwin is the author of seven New York Times best-selling books. Her latest publication, Leadership in Turbulent Times, incorporates over five decades of scholarship on Presidents Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson. And spoiler alert, you're all going home with a copy tonight, which is, which is very cool. She received the Pulitzer Prize for her biography, No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and she was awarded the Lincoln Prize for Team of Rivals, which inspired Steven Spielberg's Academy Award-winning film, Lincoln. In today's polarized world, these impressive stories of presidential leadership take on perhaps more relevance and more importance than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's give a big Greenwich welcome to one of the greatest presidential historians of our lifetime, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Thank you, Doris. It's all yours. I am so glad to be with all of you tonight. I went this afternoon to the Historical Society and had such a great time. I went through the house. And I just could feel the people who'd lived there. I saw the table where the artists would gather. And some of my guys that I studied, Lincoln Steffens, would be there. You can really feel like you're living in another place when you know that Elmer McRae, the painter, came there and fell in love with Constance Holly. And then they get married. And so I'm so glad that we are here tonight to celebrate the 90th anniversary and in this spectacular setting. I've had the wonderful chance to talk to Susan tonight and that she opened her house and this beautiful place. I'm honored to be here. So, 
We are celebrating history tonight, so let me start and tell you where my own love of history began. It really began when I was only five or six years old, and my father taught me that mysterious art of keeping score while listening to baseball games so that I could record for him the history of that afternoon's Brooklyn Dodger game. So I was originally a Brooklyn Dodger fan. It was only when they abandoned us that I, I became a Red Sox fan. Anyway, he would come home from work from Brooklyn during the day, and I could tell him every single play of every inning of the game that had taken place that afternoon, and it made me feel that there's something magic about keeping your beloved father's attention. He never told me then that all of this was actually described in great detail in the sports pages of the newspapers the next day, so I thought without me, he wouldn't even know what happened to the Brooklyn Dodgers. So it really was pretty magical. And it makes you think that somehow there's something magic about history itself, which is where that love of history began. But I learned that because of that experience with my father, when at first he'd come home, I would blurt out, the Dodgers won or the Dodgers lost, which took much of the drama of this two-hour telling away. So I finally learned you had to tell a story from beginning to middle to end. Well, incredibly, showing that everything is coincidental and comes together, my heroine, Barbara Tuckman, taught that exact thing. I, I read her book when I was in college, Guns of August. I'd never read such an extraordinary book, and she was a female historian. So she became a heroine for me, and I know how much Greenwich meant to her in this whole area. But she's the one who wrote an essay saying that even if you're writing about a war, you have to imagine to yourself you do not know how that war ended so that you can carry your reader with you every step along the way from beginning to middle to end. She said, if you know the end of the story, then what's the drama of telling it in the first place? So I think I learned that from her. So everything brings us together tonight. But I hope by turning tonight to the broader history that we all share, the turbulent times that we are living in, that history can come to the rescue. And the reason I say that is that people sometimes, because they know I love history, will stop me on a street corner or in the airport and say, is this the worst of times? And I can honestly say no. And I think about what I know about history, we've lived through much more difficult times before. The early days of the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Great Depression, the early days of World War II. And the important thing to remember is that the people living in that time, they did not know how the story would end. They lived with the same anxiety we're living with today. It's only now that we know that the American Revolution was won and our nation was born, that the Civil War ended with emancipation secured and the Union restored, that the Depression came to an end with the mobilization for the war, and that the Allies won World War II. But they had the same anxiety. But the other side of that is that it's up to us, the living, to write the next chapter of our story. And that's where I think history can give us solace, perspective, and lessons. So let me begin to tell you a little bit about this history that I love. I think never could I have imagined five decades ago when I started my career as a presidential historian that I would spend an entire lifetime living with dead presidents, waking up with them in the morning, thinking about them when I go to bed at night. It may seem an odd profession, but I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. My only fear is in the afterlife, there'll be a panel of all these presidents that I've studied. <laughs> And everyone will tell me every single thing that I missed about them. And of course, the first person to scream out will be Lyndon Johnson. How come that damn book on the Kennedys was twice as long as the book you wrote about me? But he would have a valid point, for there's no question, as was said in the introduction, that my experience of being a White House fellow for him when I was 24 years old is what led to my becoming a presidential historian. We had a curious relationship, President Johnson and me, we had a big dance at the White House the night we were selected as White House fellows. He did dance with me. It wasn't that peculiar. There were only three women out of the 16 White House fellows. But as he twirled me around the floor, he whispered that he wanted me to be assigned directly to him in the White House. But it was not to be that simple. For in the months leading up to my selection, while I was a graduate student at Harvard, I'd been active like so many young people in the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I'd written an article with a friend of mine against Lyndon Johnson, against the war, which we'd sent into the New Republic, but we hadn't heard anything at all. We were not published authors in any way. But somehow, two days after the dance in the White House, this article suddenly appeared with the title, How to Remove Lyndon Johnson from Power. <laughs> so I was certain that he would kick me out of the program. But instead, surprisingly, he said, oh, bring her down here for a year, and if I can't win her over, no one can. So I did end up eventually working for him in the White House and then accompanying him to his ranch to help him on his memoirs those last years of his life. 
And mostly I was there to listen. He loved to talk. He talked when we were in the swimming pool. He talked when we were waiting for the movies in his movie theater. He talked when he was in the car roaming around his ranch. And I like to believe that the reason he had chosen me to be there with him as he talked about his early days when he brought electricity to rural Texas, when he did the civil rights bill or voting rights bill, he just wanted to talk about anything other than the war in Vietnam, which had cut his legacy in two. And I'd like to believe it was because I was a good listener, and that's why I was there. But I also worried that he had somewhat of a minor league womanizing reputation. So I was constantly chattering to him about steady boyfriends, even when I had no boyfriends at all. And everything was perfect until one day he said he wanted to discuss our relationship, which sounded ominous, when he took me to the lake nearby called Lake Lyndon Baines Johnson. And there was wine and cheese and a red check tablecloth. And he started out, Doris, more than any other woman I've ever known, and my heart sank. And then he said, you remind me of my mother. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pretty embarrassing what was going on in my mind. But I must say, the older I've gotten, the more I realize what an incredible privilege it was to have spent so many hours with this aging lion of a man. Though defeated in the war in Vietnam, a victor in a hundred other contests, civil rights, voting rights, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform. And I'd like to believe that that privilege fired within me the drive to understand the inner person behind the public figure that I've tried to bring to each of my books since then as I moved from Lyndon Johnson to the Kennedys, from the Kennedys to FDR, from FDR to Abraham Lincoln, and finally to Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. And each one of the people that I've studied have lived through really difficult times so I'd like to just talk to you a little bit tonight about how each one seemed to be fitted for the central issue of their time. Just imagine what it was like for Abraham Lincoln when he came into office. 11 states had already seceded from the Union. A civil war in which more than 600,000 would die was about to begin. He later said if he'd ever known the anxiety that he would feel in the first three months of office before Fort Sumter, he would have thought he could not have lived through it. But he knew that he had to because he felt like democracy was in peril. What we're hearing today, you'll hear, we heard in each one of these sub subjects that I've studied, democracy was in peril. He believed that if it was true that the southern states who had lost an election could simply secede from the union because they didn't want to accept the ex results of the election, then it would prove that ordinary people could not govern themselves, that democracy was an absurdity. So what was it about Lincoln's leadership qualities that made him the right person to be there at that time. I think from the moment he entered the national stage, you could see that he had an unusual combination of confidence and humility. The night he was elected president, he could not sleep. He made that decision. He knew what he did not know. He made that decision that he didn't know enough to not surround himself with people who knew more than he did. So he brought, famously, his chief three rivals, Seward, Chase, and Bates, into his cabinet each one better known, better educated, more celebrated. Each one thought he should be president instead of Abraham Lincoln. His friends said, you can't do this. You'll look like a figurehead. He said, I have to do this. The country is in peril. These are the strongest and most able men in the country. I need them by my side. So then he brought them in. And how did he create a team that was able to work with him and eventually see him as their leader? And what he was able to do is just emotionally intelligent stuff. He gave credit to everybody when they did things that even he was responsible for. In his papers, you find hundreds of handwritten letters thanking people for doing something that they should get pride in. He took blame when things went wrong. He shouldered blame. He was able to um, put past resentments beside. You know, when I first started working on Lincoln, there were Lincoln scholars came up to me and they said, you are going to feel you're a better person by the end of this time. And I ended up spending 10 years writing about Lincoln and five years more working with Spielberg. So 15 years of my life, I'd like to believe that he had an impact. He had the normal human emotions of envy, anger, or jealousy. But he would say, if you allow those emotions to fester, they will poison a part of you. And how true that was. So, for example, he had... When he was, after he got into the cabinet, he needed to get a new Secretary of War. His first Secretary of War had resigned. And everybody tells him, this guy, Edward Stanton, he's the best guy for the job. Stanton had humiliated him on a law case many years before. And yet he was able to forget that deep hurt and bring him into the cabinet. And Stanton later said he came to love Lincoln more than anyone outside of his family.
And then he found ways to control his emotions in this enormous pressure that he was under. He had this wonderful ritual called the hot letter. When he was angry at somebody, he would write a long letter to the person and then put it aside, hoping he would cool down psychologically and never need to send it. The famous case of that is when General Meade failed to follow up with General Lee's army after the victory at Gettysburg. He knew that the war could have come to an end if he had captured Lee's army, but instead it was going to go on month after month, year after year. So he wrote a long letter to General Meade. He said, I'm immeasurably distressed. You didn't do what we asked you to do. The war is now going to go on. But then he knew that it would paralyze the general who was in the field, so he put the letter aside. It was never even seen until his papers opened, and underneath was the notation, never sent or never signed. And there were dozens of similar letters in his papers. And then he also had the leadership trait of making himself accessible when people would come into the White House in the morning. In those days before civil service, you could go and visit the president and ask him for a job as a postmaster or a clerk. And he would spend hours in the morning just talking to these ordinary people. And his, his young secretaries, Nicolay and Hay, finally said to him, Mr. President, you don't have time for these ordinary people. He said, you're wrong. These are my public opinion baths. I must never forget the popular assemblage from which I have come. And as a result, what he was able to do, not only by meeting these people in the morning, but by going out to visit the troops. He went to the active battlefield a dozen times. He said he needed to bolster morale, to help the people in the hospitals, to walk with the people who were fighting the thing, to give them a sense of, of, of the future. It allowed him to become a master of timing because he had a feeling for public sentiment, which is what all leaders must do. He later said if he had issued the Emancipation Proclamation six months earlier, he would have lost the border states and lost the war. If he'd waited any longer, he would have lost the morale boost it provided. As it was, it was the perfect timing on January 1st, 1963. 1863. But there, I get my centuries mixed up sometimes. <laughs> but what happened is that day, New Year's Day, he had shaken hundreds of hands at a huge New Year's reception. So when he went to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, his own hand was numb and shaking. He put this, the pen down. He said, if ever my soul were in an act, it is in this act. But if I sign with a shaking hand, posterity will say he hesitated. So he waited and waited until he could sign with an unusually bold and clear hand. But then amazingly, he was also able to find, as all leaders must, ways to relieve stress when he was in high-pressured situations. He actually went to the theater more than 100 times during the Civil War. He said when the lights came down and a Shakespeare play came on, for a few precious hours, he could imagine himself back at the War of the Roses and forget the war that was raging. But he also was able to find enormous solace from telling funny stories. I knew I was going to like him as a great statesman and a politician, but I had no idea that stories and humor were absolutely central to his being. He later said that, that humor whistled off sadness. So in the midst of the most pressured cabinet meetings, he would come up with a funny story that had something to do with what was going on. One of his favorite stories that he'd love to tell over and over again, I told on John Stewart and got bleeped as a result. You will hear why. The story had to do with the Revolutionary War hero, Ethan Allen. And as Lincoln told the story, he went to Britain after the war, and they were deciding to embarrass him. He was going to a dinner party by putting a huge picture of General George Washington in the only outhouse where he'd have to encounter it sooner or later. They figured he'd be really pissed off at the indignity of George Washington being in an outhouse. But he came out of the outhouse not upset at all. They said, well, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. I think it was the perfectly appropriate place for him. What do you mean, they said? Well, he said, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. <laughs> and he had hundreds of these stories. So then, then just think of that same man with all that pressure, with all those burdens, with all that humor, with all that political skill, when the war is finally won and the second inaugural is about to take place and he can tell that the war is going to be won. No triumphal message does he deliver. On the contrary, he said that both sides prayed to God. Both sides read the same Bible. Neither's prayers were fully answered. And then the famous words, with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. So there's old Abe Lincoln, the best of them all in many ways. But now come with me to another difficult time, the turn of the 20th century, when Teddy Roosevelt came into power. It's a time very similar to our own in many ways. The Industrial Revolution had shaken up the economy, much like the globalization and tech revolution have done today. Big companies were swallowing up small companies. 
There was a sense in the people in the country who were very suspicious of people in the city. There was a gap between the rich and the poor that had never really been there before. All these new inventions made people feel the automobile and the telegraph and the telephone, that maybe there was a nostalgia for an earlier way of life. There were anarchist bombings in the streets, nationwide labor strikes. Democracy, it said, was in peril at that very time. And yet Teddy Roosevelt turned out to be the right person to knit the country together, in part because of the experiences in his life. He didn't start out as a, as a promising leader in some ways. He had enormous confidence, which is a great leadership quality. But that confidence was really arrogance. In fact, it was said that he so loved being the center of attention that he wanted to be at all times the bride at the wedding, the corpse at the funeral, and the baby at the baptism. <laughs> So when he went into the state legislature at first, he would just constantly yell things. He was very popular in New York State because he was constantly yelling so much at his Democratic opponents that he made headlines everywhere along the way. But after a while, he was jumping up and down like a jack-in-the-box that even his Republican friends didn't like what he was doing. And he finally was able to have the humility to understand that he had made a mistake and to change his point of view. And he became a productive legislator reducing his histrionic talk and moderating his language. But then what really changed him in many ways was a tragedy that happened in his early life. He was in Albany when his wife was about to give birth to their first child. She was 22 years old. His 49-year-old mother had come to stay with her while he was in Albany. And he got a telegram saying, the kid is born, a daughter is born, they celebrate cigars. A couple hours later comes another telegram telling him, you must come home at once. Your wife and your mother are dying. His mother had contracted typhoid fever that week in New York. He got home in time just before she died, and 12 hours later, his wife died in childbirth. So depressed was he that he left the East Coast, he left the state legislature, and he went out to the Badlands, where he spent two years as a cowboy and a rancher. But that experience of being out there was what made it possible for him to be the president he was, because he suddenly became a Westerner as well as an Easterner, and those were the two gaps in, this, in the country, the East versus West. But more importantly, he realized that fate could come in and take everything away in a moment. Before, he'd been very ambitious. He thought, I'd become a state legislator, and then I'd become a congressman, and then I'd become a senator, and then I'd become a governor, and then I'd become a president. But now he realized that anything could take it away at any moment, so he would choose any job that he really wanted that was meaningful work rather than just an upward climb because he felt if you're just upward climbing, you're too cautious in what you do. You don't give everything to it. So he came back to the East Coast and he became a civil service commissioner. They said, this is too low for you. Why are you doing this? And he said, because meritocracy matters. I want this job. And he did really well at it. And then he becomes a police commissioner in New York. And that meant that he saw slums and tenements that his privileged life had not allowed him to see before. And then he becomes something he did want, an assistant secretary of the Navy, but the war breaks out, the Spanish-American War, and he decides to become a soldier instead. And they say, how are you giving up all this power to become an ordinary soldier? But he creates the Rough Riders, which are made up of woodsmen and cowboys sitting side by side with Yale yachtsmen and famous tennis players from Harvard. And he learned how to bring people together. So when he finally becomes governor and then president of the United States, he was the perfectly suited to knit the country together. And he did so by a simple slogan, the square deal for the rich and the poor, the capitalist and the wage worker. He formed a progressive middle between socialism and extreme right-wing conservatism. He had rational reforms for the Industrial Revolution. Only big companies, not just big companies did he go after, but only if they weren't playing by the rules of the game. And then he would take a train around the country to give exactly the same message in all parts of the country, the square deal. And everywhere he went, people would come to listen to him. And then as the train pulled away, he could stay there for hours just waving to people who would stand at the little road crossings along the way. But one time he was waving and there was a rather cold reception until he was told that his frantic raving was producing no result because he was waving frantically at a herd of cows because he was so nearsighted. Little wonder they were not responding. So he was the right man suited for that time and became as a very productive and powerful president. But now just imagine an even more difficult time in our history, the spring of 1933. The depression had hit rock bottom. One out of four people were out of work. There was no safety net in that time. So starving people were wandering the streets. The banking system had collapsed. 
The banks no longer had the currency to let people take their money out, people lining up by the dozens trying to get their money out, bolting the doors. And there was a sense in which capitalism and the entire financial structure was at, at risk. He was told when he first took office that if your New Deal program, which he had talked about during the campaign works, you will be considered one of the great presidents. If it fails, you'll be one of the worst. He said, no, if it fails, I will be the last American president. That's how, how, how tough things were at that time. And then extraordinarily, in part because he had come through his own adversity, he had come through the polio attack that had paralyzed him from the waist down. He had an optimism and a confidence that he would somehow keep getting through that, and he worked at it year after year to get his body strong enough so that he could go in a wheelchair so he could back in public life. He was the right person to deal with a paralyzed nation. And that first inaugural shockingly changed the mood of the country. He understood something that leaders have to, a fine line between realism and optimism. He started off saying only the foolish optimists will say that this is not a brutal time. But then came the famous phrase, but there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And he said that the people had not failed, that it was leadership that had failed, and he was there to provide that leadership. He would ask the Congress for a series of measures to get people to work. If they didn't go through it, he would take executive powers as if we were at war, because this was similar to a war. That single speech changed the mood of the country. Headlines all over the country. We have a leader. The government still lives. Hundreds of thousands of letters came into the White House. And I, my favorite letter came from a man. He said, my dog ran away. My roof has fallen off. My wife is mad at me. I lost my job. But everything's all right now, because you are there. <laughs> So that's the magic of leadership that it's hard to understand. And then what he was able to do is he called an emergency session to get the banking bill passed that would get the banks back on their feet. And then he thought, this is pretty good. They're doing pretty well, the Congress. So he decided to keep them in, in session for 100 days. And that's where the first 100 days that every president has not wanted to be measured against has come. But during that 100 days, what he did was to speak to the people on radio fireside chats in a way that he could explain each one of the programs that was being passed in a very conversational tone. He always used one-syllable words instead of two or three-syllable words. He talked, he started out, my friends. People felt that he was actually talking to them. There's a story of a, a construction worker hurrying home one night, and his partner said, where are you going? He said, well, my president, he's coming to speak to me in my living room tonight. It's only right that I be there to greet him when he comes. Saul Bellow, the novelist, said you could walk down the street on a hot Chicago night when one of these fireside chats was on the air, and you could watch people just staring in the kitchens or their living rooms at their radio and hear his voice come out. You could keep walking and not miss a word of what he's saying because everybody was listening. And he understood. People said to him, you've got to go on the radio every day. It's the only way morale will be sustained. He said, if my speeches ever become routine, they will lose their effectiveness, something our modern presidents could learn about when they're on the air every day. Just do it when you need to talk to the people, and then maybe they will listen. Well, now come with me to another crisis that Franklin Roosevelt faced in the spring of 1940. In the space of a single week, the German Blitzkrieg had come through Europe, and tens of thousands were dead, surrender of Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium, and, original, and eventually France leaving only England standing alone. US wanted desperately to help England, but we had very little that we could do because we had almost no planes and tanks and modern weapons. We were only 18th in military power at that point. We became 17th only when Holland surrendered to Germany. So Roosevelt knew that he had to pivot. He had to change his relationship to the business community, which had been marked by hostility in the last years of the New Deal before the war. He knew that only business could build the planes, the ships, the tanks, and the weapons. So he put out an olive branch to the business community. He paid for the cost. The government would pay for the cost of transforming from car manufacturing plants into airplanes or, or tanks or ships. He relaxed antitrust regulations, accelerated depreciation. He brought in the heads of Sears and Chrysler to run his production agencies in the government. They were so glad to give back to the country that had done so well by then. So even 18 months before Pearl Harbor, the assembly lines had begun to move. And then after Pearl Harbor, the productivity was so staggering that they were able to produce a plane every four minutes, a tank every seven minutes, and a ship every single day was launched. And it used to take 200 days to produce a ship before this mass, mass production took place. 
and through Lend-Lease, our planes, our tanks, and our ships and our weapons were used by all our allies in the far corners of the world. So what happens at this point is that good old Eleanor Roosevelt comes around and argues that women should go to work in the factories. She had been already arguing for women. She had a weekly press conference where only female reporters could come. And as a result, all over the country, stuffy publishers had to hire their first female reporters. An entire generation got their start because of Eleanor Roosevelt. So now she starts to argue that women should go to work in the factories. And at first, the factory owners say, they'll never learn to operate these complicated machines. They'll distract the men on the assembly line. Productivity will go down. We can't have a social revolution in the middle of the mobilization for war. But of course, by 1940, 40, 42, and 43, with so many men in the armed forces, they opened their doors to women. And the great thing is, by 43, when women performed 60% of the jobs in the airplane factories and the shipyards, productivity shot up rather than down. So these same old factory owners decided, we better do a study and figure out how would these women learn to operate these complex machines so well and so quickly. I love the answer that came back on one of the study forms. They said it was very simple. When a woman, unlike a man, was asked to operate a new piece of machinery, she would ask directions. <laughs> Any of us who used to travel with you guys in the days before GPS, never opening the windows, know what that means? Well, anyways, it was the greatest business-government partnership in the history of the country. Well, still, of course, there was enormous pressure on FDR, as there was, uh, was on Abraham Lincoln, but he found ways to relax. He probably had the best way of relaxing. During World War II, there was a cocktail party in the White House every night, and the rule was you could not talk about the war. You could talk about books you'd read, movies you'd seen, gossip about people which he loved, as long as the war didn't get mentioned. So for a few precious hours, he could forget that war that was raging, just as Lincoln did in the theater. So after a while, this cocktail party mattered so much to him that he wanted the people who would be the regulars at the cocktail party to live in the White House to be ready for the cocktail party. So the White House became the most exclusive residential hotel you could possibly imagine. His foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, came for dinner one night early in the war, slept over, never left until the war came to an end. His secretary, Missy Lahand, lived with the family in the White House. Lorena Hickok, a friend of Eleanor's, lived right there. The princess from Norway came on the weekends. Princess Martha lived with the family. And the great Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in a room right there on the second floor with the, in, with the family. So when I was finishing the book on Franklin and Eleanor, and I was on a radio program in Washington, I was just obsessed with wanting to know who is sleeping there now in these rooms that were there then. And it happened that Hillary Clinton was listening then in the White House to the radio program. So she called me up at the radio station and invited me to a sleepover in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridor together and figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband and I, with my map in hand, went through every room up there and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins slept, the Clintons are sleeping where FDR slept, and we were in Winston Churchill's bedroom. There was no way I could sleep. I was certain he was sitting in the corner drinking his brandy. Can you imagine? And smoking his cigar. In fact, that bedroom is the scene of my favorite story in World War II. When Churchill came there, he and Roosevelt were set right after Pearl Harbor to sign a document that put the Associated Nations against the Axis powers, but no one liked the word Associated Nations. So Roosevelt awakened that morning with the whole new idea of calling them the United Nations against the Axis powers. He was so excited, he had himself wheeled into Churchill's bedroom to tell him the news. But it so happened Churchill was just coming out of the bathtub and had absolutely nothing on. So Roosevelt said, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. But Churchill, incredibly, standing straight, dripping from the tub, nothing on, in a very formal voice said, oh no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. It's a great, right? So, so then Roosevelt tells them the idea of the United Nations, and then Churchill can quote an entire, still with nothing on, quote an entire poem in British literature where the words United Nations had once been used. So the next morning I couldn't wait to go in the bathtub, and then I truly felt I am living in the greatness of the past. Well, when FDR died, people gathered on the street corners, holding on to one another, and saying over and over the same refrain, we have lost our friend. It was an expression of the intimate bond that he had created with the people. So now, finally, come with me and imagine LBJ taking office in 1963 after JFK's assassination. 
And then we watch on television not only that, but the murder of his assassin, Oswald. There's speculation that there could be a conspiracy of Russia, China, or the mafia. And at that same moment, despite the courage and leadership of the civil rights movement, the bill that JFK had finally introduced to end segregation in the South was totally stuck in the Congress with really no thought that it would be able to come out. And there was fear that it might lead to widespread violence in the streets. So LBJ understood when he first came into office that he had to take the reins of power and he had to show steady leadership and he had to deal with the Congress and he had to deal with that civil rights bill. So he made in his very first public statement the statement that he would make his first priority the passage of the civil rights bill. His advisor said, you're crazy to do this. It'll never break the filibuster. You'll be failed. You'll go before the electorate as a failed president. You only have a certain amount of currency as president. You cannot spend it on this. But he said then famously, then what the hell is the presidency for? And then he set to work. He brought every single congressman, not just the leaders, every single congressman to wash to the White House for a social dinner in groups of 30. He would then have port and brandy with the guys while Lady Bird would take the women on, mostly then women spouses, on a tour of the mansion. And then the next day, he would start calling them to make a deal. In those days, before transparency, you could make deals. You could promise things, which was a good thing. So he started calling them at 6 a.m. He'd call them at noon. He called them at midnight. He even called a senator at 2 a.m. I hope I didn't wake you up. Oh, no, the senator said I was looking at the ceiling, hoping my president would call. <laughs> and then he had tape recorders so that he could make sure that he knew what deals he had made. And the most important thing was he had to bring 22 Republicans to join the 44 Northern Democrats to break that filibuster, which meant that he had to reach Everett Dirksen, the minority leader from Illinois. And the tapes are incredible. You hear him talking to Dirksen. You want me to come to Peoria, to Springfield? I'll be there. You want an ambassadorship? You got it. You want a dam? You've got it. But finally, the closing argument is, Everett, you come with me on this bill, and you bring Republicans to join the Northern Democrats. 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. How could Dirksen resist? He brings the Republicans. They break the filibuster. And the law passes that ends segregation in the South changing the face of our country. Well, there's one funny story about the taping system. I met this guy. Yeah, it's, it's pretty great, isn't it? Um, there was, was a man named Don Kendall, who was the CEO of Pepsi-Cola. And I met him years later. He said, no, I know you knew Lyndon Johnson. You were, you were a young girl. But I have a story I bet you don't know. And so he said that when Richard Nixon came into office, he was a good friend of Nixon's, and Nixon asked him to go to Johnson's ranch to talk about some sensitive matter. So he said, I get to the ranch, Johnson's working on his memoirs. He looks up, grumpily, and he says, how am I supposed to remember what happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago? The only chapter that is really good is at this tape machine. I pressed a button. I have verbatim conversation, and those chapters are going out really well. So you go back and tell your good friend Nixon as he starts his presidency, there is nothing more important than a taping system. <laughs> and thereby, Lyndon Johnson contributes to the downfall of the good friend, Richard Nixon. Well, in the last years of Johnson's life on the ranch, when I was down there with him, the one thing at least he was taking hope in was the hope that he might be remembered for what he did with civil rights. It wasn't just the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. The next year, he gave an extraordinary speech to Congress called the We Shall Overcome speech at a joint session after the Selma demonstrations had taken place the Sunday before with the, the bloody Sunday when the, the people that were peacefully demonstrating were hit upon by bullwhips and, and hoses, et cetera. And I remember I was in graduate school when I was listening to that speech. And I had been at the Civil Rights March in 1963. And we were listening to that speech. And when he came out for voting rights, and the speech is extraordinary. Every now and then, history and fate meet at a certain time at a certain place. So it was in Lexington and Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was in Selma, Alabama. This is not a Negro problem, not a white problem, not a, not a northern problem, not a southern problem. It's not even a moral problem, because there's simply wrong to deny your fellow Americans the right to vote. And then he said, but even if we get this right to vote, then we still have a long way to go to get equality. But if we work together, we shall overcome. And many weeks late, not many weeks later, that Voting Rights Act passed. When I listened to that speech, I could never have imagined that three years later, I would end up working for the man that delivered that speech. But more importantly, 10 years later, 
I would marry Richard Goodwin, the man who wrote that speech, as the chief speechwriter for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, so he was, he was pretty special. I, I mean, my, my husband worked for JFK. He was everywhere. He was like Zelig in the 60s. He worked for JFK in, in 1960 in the campaign. Then he was in the White House. And then he was in the White House when the body came back in 63, worked on the eternal flame, ended up working for Lyndon Johnson, wrote the Great Society speech, wrote the, wrote the um, We Shall Overcome speech, the Howard University speech. Then he eventually turned against the war, was with McCarthy in New Hampshire. But then Bobby Kennedy was his best friend, and he was with Bobby Kennedy when he died, went out with Jackie Kennedy. And he had an extraordinary time. And um, I was talking to Susan tonight because my husband died a couple years ago, so we both know what it's like to live with a wonderful man for a long period of time and to have lost him. But I'm so glad to be here tonight with all of you. And, and I don't mean to go into all that, but anyway, let, let me say that Johnson was hoping in those last years that he would be remembered for civil rights. I went off on a tangent. But, um, and I, I wish he had known before he died what his daughters now knew, do know. Historians keep ranking him further and further up on the polls because of what he did, not only for civil rights, but for social justice. So I'm glad to know that about him. He deserves it. But in the end, in the end, no one's, no one's legacy burns brighter than that of Abraham Lincoln. He won the war, saved the Union, and ended slavery forever. But even Lincoln, who knew the war was going to be won before he died, could never have imagined how long and how far his reputation would reach. I was so thrilled to find an interview with Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian writer, given to a New York reporter at the turn of the 20th century that showed how far Lincoln's reach had gone, that allowed me to end Team of Rivals with that rather than his death. I never want them to die at the end of these books because I've lived with them for so long. The story Tolstoy stole was extraordinary. He said he had just come back from a remote area of the Caucasus where there were a group of wild barbarians who'd never left that part of Russia. They were so excited to have Tolstoy in their midst, they asked him to tell stories of the great men of history. So he said, I told them about Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Frederick the Great, and they seemed to love it. But before I finished, the chief of the barbarians stood up and he said, but wait, you haven't told us about the greatest ruler of them all. We want to hear about that man who spoke with a voice of thunder, who laughed like the sunrise, who claimed from that place called America that is so far from here that if a young man should travel there, he would be an old man when he arrived. Tell us of that man. Tell us of Abraham Lincoln. Tolstoy said he was stunned to know that Lincoln's name had reached this remote corner, but he told him everything he knew about Lincoln. And then the, the New York reporter said to him, so what made Lincoln so great after all? And Tolstoy said, well, he wasn't as great a general as Napoleon, Maybe not as great a statesman as Frederick the Great, but his supremacy existed altogether in the greatness of his character, the ultimate standard for judging our leaders. So in the end, if our course of history suggests that we've needed great leaders at great moments, it's not simply that, because change really comes from the ground up. When Lincoln was called a liberator, he said, don't call me that. It was the anti-slavery movement and the Union soldiers that did it all. It was the progressive movement in the settlement houses and in the cities and states in the social gospel that allowed Teddy Roosevelt to do what he did. And of course, the civil rights movement was everything important for LBJ and the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the environmental movement today. The course of our history suggests, and this is the greatest lesson that history can provide, that the task of rebuilding our democracy now and, and healing the divides between us, securing that right to vote is not beyond us. Problems created by man can be solved by man. It's a matter of whether the citizens will have the will and the anxious and the ability to, to act to do what is necessary. And if the history of our country is a guide, then all of us believe here who care about the historical society here tonight, we have the strength and the will to do this, and we must. For ourselves, for our children and our grandchildren, history is counting on us, and I suspect we will come through. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Doris Kearns Goodwin for that inspiring message. Listening to you reminds us that historical knowledge and perspective is crucial to build a more civil society to ensure a better future. I'm Deborah Mecki, the Executive Director and CEO of the Greenwich Historical Society, and I want to express my sincere appreciation to each person in this room for your contribution to our success, success, not only tonight, but for many of you for many, many years. The board and I could not uh, have that success without a stellar staff, including our incredible development staff led by Ryan Knuckle and our special events manager, Danny Suozo. As a private nonprofit that receives no funds from the town of Greenwich, our development committee plays an essential role. Helping to lead that effort for the past decade has been trustee Robert Getz, who will close out our program with a brief remarks and a toast. Thank you. You can stay. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, I'm glad that Deborah's here because I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Deborah for 26 years of leadership and to recognize and thank her talented staff for their commitment to the Historical Society and its mission. So with that, thank you. <laughs> Thanks to all of your generosity, I am thrilled to announce that tonight's 90th anniversary event has raised almost $700,000. A real testament to our co-chairs, the host committee, all of you, but, uh, and the staff that have made this evening a great success. So thank you so much to you all of you. These funds will be used in support of the Historical Society's well-recognized programs in education, the arts, and historic preservation. To all of you, I have my glass. To all of you on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Greenwich Historical Society, I raise a glass in deep appreciation of your support of the Greenwich Historical Society, and together, let's raise our glasses together in celebration of the historical society's 90 years of excellence and service to our town and community and to cheers 90 more years. Thank you very much. At this point, enjoy the rest of the evening and I'm gonna turn it over to Bob Harvick to entertain you. Enjoy the evening, thank you very much.